So um, this afternoon, we are very fortunate to have with us um, two speakers, Dr. Martin Law and Sydney Yu from the Proton Therapy to give a talk on the introduction to the role of medical physics in, sync in hospital from insider's perspective. So let me give a brief um, introduction of our two speakers. So Dr. Martin Law obtained his PhD from Canada. Then he spent uh, about 20 years working in Hong Kong as a medical physicist at the Queen Mary Hospital. Uh, then later on, he moved to Singapore and worked in um, some hospital before joining the proton therapy as a medical physicist in 2019. Um, Dr. Sidney Yu obtained his PhD from Purdue University in medicinal chemistry uh, with specialty in radio pharmaceutical and radiation chemistry. Then he spent many years in the US before moving to the Department of Nuclear Medicine in Singapore General Hospital. And when he was there, he helped to establish the first positron emission tomography center in Singapore. And then he was also involved um, in different areas and before moving on to proton therapy to be the director of radio pharmaceutical. So um, without further ado, uh, Let's start the colloquium today. Okay, um, um, welcome, welcome to our talk. Uh, my name is Martin Law, and I will, I will uh, start, start the, uh, the, the first part first, and then uh, Dr. Yu, Dr. Yu will join, join me and keep going to the end of the talk. So, uh, very so, very briefly, uh, we, we shall discuss uh, the role of uh, being a medical physicist in uh, uh, because uh, uh, there are so many hospitals in Singapore and they have a uh, very, very good or well equipped departments in radiology, radiotherapy and nuclear medicine. So uh, we, shall, we shall share our experience in, in, in these areas. So basically we are going to introduce some kind of uh, basic physics uh, as a background to be to be as a medical physicist, and then uh, I shall kind of uh, add on my suggestions, and also Dr. Yu will also add on his suggestions and ideas uh, to to promote the medical physics uh, area in Singapore for the for the person person time and also for the uh, for the for the near future really because we shall have uh, lots of. Uh, uh, real equipments and and proton centers being built. So, and then at the end of the day, and then at the end of the day, I, uh, we shall discuss a kind of a, a one advertisement which recently come to the market and then see what they this this kind of a hospital what they are looking for their medical physics. So uh, I shall start with something like like uh, uh, directly to the to the hospitals really in in a kind of a well established hospitals. There will be a uh, X-ray department, or some people call it radiology department, and also they have will have uh, leukemia medicine and fellow radiotherapy, and nowadays they call cancer centers, cancer centers, and and the cancer centers or the radiotherapy department, they are going or they have been uh, treating patients with uh, cancer disease and so on, and while the radiology department or leukemia medicine department. Mostly, they will do some kind of dialog diagnostic uh, uh, examination to uh, to the general public. All right. Being being a medical physics in in a hospital, we shall also provide some service like radiation protection or health physics advice or service to other departments. All right. Maybe for example, uh, the the work the 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 radiation used in uh, operating room so that and then of course I, here I put down kind of a, a cardiologist performing the uh, ca ca uh, cardiac cardiac intervention in uh, what we call capillarization lab and they have a powerful by plane x-ray systems in the lab and then we and then this normal they will ask medical physics to check on their systems or once a year or twice a year and if they, they do have a Problem in between, they will also ask the physics, the medical physics, to come around to help them to fix it or, or, or to give them some advices and so on. And then, in other words, uh, we shall also also kind of uh, give 
give us some kind of investigation in case of some some personnel or patient being over overexposed over exposed by the radiation or the unsealed radiation radioactive substances and so on and uh, and uh, being uh, able to do some research or development uh, related to the interest of that of, of the patient service this these are basically the the uh, uh, the the role of being a medical physician in hospitals. Uh, if if the centers or the hospital is a kind of a teaching hospital, then probably probably you, you should have uh, some knowledge in medical medical statistics because there will be lots of uh, patient data to analyze and then to hopefully using medical statistics they can draw up some kind of a conclusions uh, for the treatments or dialog diagnosis and etc. Et and also if it if it is a kind of a teaching hospital, uh, uh, medical physicists may be required to do some kind of teaching to, to the staff or sometimes to the general, general public. If a general public may have some concern on, on, on some kind of treatments or examination table, uh, the medical physics may be required or requested to provide some kind of a, a lectures to them or a talk or curriculum to, to, to the personnel and general public. Uh, let me go on for the uh, radiology department or what we call the X-ray department. Um, I mean, the X-ray department really use the X-ray for their work and obviously they cannot get, get rid of this X-ray tube. Uh, the X-ray tube is, is very simple. Um, you have a, a, a filament, filament, very wide, fine wire filament. Normally they, they, they use a tungsten and due to the fermionic emission, that means you apply some some voltage and current, the filament will be heated, heated up, heated up. And if there's a there, if there's this kind of a potential difference across the anode and the filament, normally talking about kilovolts uh, in the X-ray department, there will be a, a kind of a electric field to uh, attract the electrons due to the fermionic emission to the anode, to the anode here. And then the anode is being, uh, is being bombarded uh, bombarded by the electrons and giving off the uh, X-ray. This is basically the, the very cool or very simple idea to produce X-rays. Uh, and then for a real X-ray tube, for a real X-ray tube is not like this, okay? The box, I mean, the outside box is simply has a shooting, shooting purposes uh, as kind of a eliminate the X-ray leaking out, leaking out from, this, uh, from the body of the uh, X-ray tube. And there is a kind of an exit window. Exit window, you, we can imagine it's only a, a kind of a window, glass window light in our house, and then the X-ray can penetrate out of the window and then to, to, to some, kind of, some kind of a direction that you want the beam to be, to be signed on. All right, this is a basic simple, simple idea of a, an X-ray tube. And you can see two kind of a night like entrance here. This entrance are used for, uh, for hooking up the cables, the high voltage, uh, high potential cables and so on. And, the, and then another one for the anode and, and then the, the, the filament, also for the filament and so on. Uh, the basic physics for X-ray is obviously, everyone knows that, is that uh, if uh, electrons are being buffered, electron energetic electron coming out, coming out uh, from the X-ray tip, uh, I should say, look, Coming out from the uh, from the from the filament and hitting on the anode or the targets, some of them will bend around the nucleus. Okay, some of them will bend will, will bend around the nucleus, and in doing so, there will be kind some some kind of a X ray, what we call the branchial radiation coming off from where they they interact with the with the uh, nucleus. All right, and some of them some of the Incident, the electron simply hit on hit on some some uh, some some at the electrons at the at the outer cell at the at the atomic outer cell like, like in this here. Uh, I got an incoming electrons instead of being bent bent around the the nucleus, it lock out had simply like had on lock out the electrons sitting one on one of the orbitals. All right, once once. The electrons or the the, the the outer cell electron being locked out. The another electron at the outer cell will will be fill up the, the the hole, and in doing so, there's some kind of a, a well-defined 
X-ray with, with a definite uh, X, uh, energy to be emitted. And then, and then you can see, you can see that the, what we call the character, with character X-ray, uh, uh, X-ray with defined energy. The spectrum, if you look at, if you look at these two, two phenomena, the spectrum is like this, okay? And then basically you have a, something, some, the book and I, the book and I is that uh, there's nothing, nothing has a, has a filter to filter out the low energy X-ray, all right? But in, in practice, we shall have a, uh, some material in order to, fil to filter out the low energy X-ray. Uh, so it may be looks, the, the, the spectrum will be coming from the zero, which is, and then rising up, and then there will, depends on the tar target element, there will be some kind of a peak uh, uh, representing the, the, the characteristic X-ray characteristic X -ray, uh, coming out from the, from the X-ray tip, all right? And then the end point here, uh, in this case is 100, 100 kilovolt. That means the maximum energy for the X-ray spectrum or the X-ray itself is 100 ki uh, kilovolt energy, all right? So that, 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 that is the, the general way we produce the X-ray for imaging, for patient imaging, uh, and so on, all right? The reason to, to, to have a, this just kind of a filtering is to cut off, cut off the, the lower energy, which doesn't contribute to the imaging, but may give a little bit higher, higher skin dose to the patient, which we, we, don't want that. We, we don't want that. So we can get rid of this by adding a little bit of uh, what we call filtration. Filtration, uh, in normally it's only about two mm or three mm aluminum, aluminum plate in, inside the X-ray tube, okay? So the X-ray passing through, passing through the aluminum and it becomes, uh, in it becomes absorbed with uh, 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 the lower energy part of the, the X-ray will be absorbed like this. So, so uh, the, the patient, the patient will skin dose will not be enhanced uh, because because uh, our body have a uh, different organs and different organs represent some kind of uh, uh, attenuation coefficients that uh, that will will attenuate actually be, we can see the, dif the, the difference between different organs one is being irradiated irradiated uh, sorry irradiated in this case that uh, that uh, we are the patient here is taking a a lung, uh, lung scan or lung X-ray, plant chest X-ray, we can see the different absorption of uh, uh, X-ray at different organs. So here, the lung has a very little attenuation, so it becomes black. You know, the the X-ray will penetrate through the body and hit, hit the, uh, the the detector. Now they will use a detector instead of film. So uh, we can dialog making of this to dialog diagnostics of uh, the patient disease. Now. Now, so far, so 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 far, uh, the department of uh, radiology <clears throat> occupied most of uh, X-ray machine CT and uh, and so on. That means that means the, the medical physicists have a role to make sure or to ensure the machines are. Uh, able to meet this standard or the quality of the radiation. How to do that? Or what we call the QA or QC procedures. What we, how to do that? We just use a, some kind of a slit place and it's slit below the distance or the night pair and then place it on the exit window of, uh, or maybe one or two CM in front of the, uh, the exit window of the X-ray and then let the X-ray sign through this uh, slit and then we can do, we can capture the images and then see, and then qualitatively, qualitatively see which pattern that we just, just see the difference. And then and obviously we can also use uh, some kind of a software to, to mix, to make purpose to diagnostics, uh, the, 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 this, this spacing. In doing so, we can, if you do that, maybe every, every, every week, we have a, uh, maybe have a, a curve to show the performance, and some and one day, if one day that uh, the this it may not be the same as what, what you have in the past, that that means the the X-ray tube may be deteriorating. All right, and it's very common for the X-ray tube to be malfunctioned in in the radiology department because of the high volume of the 
the patient surface and part particular for CT, okay? Particular for CT because a free, free CT is a really three dimensional. And then you can have a different cross section through the, through the patient images and make and help the radiologist diagnostic the, this disease more easier, uh, easier than the than the plain X-ray that I just showed. For the CT is is again an X-ray source here, okay, an X-ray source, but of course much powerful, much much powerful than the chest X-ray that I showed you uh, in, the, in the last two uh, slides. And then you have a you have a collimator to control the width of the emerging or the exit X-ray X-ray from the, and then if the patient patient being scanned, you can see the patient, you can see, uh, see the feed images of the patient because the, the system or the X-ray trip is rotating in a circle and then, and then the table is also moving inside. That means you can have a, a, a series of three dimensional images of the, of, the, of the body of the patient that you want to, to scan. For a medical physicist, how do I know the performance of a CT? All right, and uh, nowadays, nowadays uh, we use a phantom. This is an international recognized phantom called Cat Fan Phantom, in which there's a lot, maybe 10, 10, uh, 10 slides or 10 sections of uh, material, and each material and each slice or section have its own use, or the uh, the images of each section will will directly relate it to the performance of CT. Let me show you some example on this. One of uh, these are may, maybe the two important uh, characteristics that uh, you can get from the cat fan phantom. One of the one of them is the the uniformity uh, in uniformity. Here, there's a, a session filled up with water. All right, okay, and the CT number. Everyone knows. Uh, uh, I mean, if some people know about medical physics, they will know that the CT number the CT number for water is zero. All right, so. So if I got a scan like this, and then I draw, I, I draw a region to say, to find out the, the CT number in that region, give me, it give me maybe point, point, uh, 0 point, point 0.7, the other one is about 0. So end up, it end up maybe 0 plus or minus something, you know, within the specification of the machine or, and so on. Okay, and look at the, the what we call spatial resolution. Inside the Kevin Phantom, there's a section of this. And then if you do your, do your alignment very well. You can have a you can have a, some kind of a pattern like this. All right. Uh, again, you can you can use some kind of a software to help you to find out which one that you cannot be solved. But you can use your eye. I mean, use our eyesight to say, okay, this one we just, I just uh, just can see, it. and this one I cannot see. It. So you can you can you can uh, uh, you can find out the spacing or the line pairs. Of this, this, uh, this uh, set, set, sectors from the from the manual of the Kevin Phantom. In other words, if you if you do your QA with the Kevin Phantom, you you should think you, you should know that uh, every section or every set sectors of the, the, the Phantom and uh, the use of it, the result of it, what kind of result you will expect because different CT have would have a different performance or or the able to to see what kind of uh, uh, resolution. It will give you give you at the end of the day, All right? Uh, uh, the routine work of a medical physician in in radiology department is basically uh, is basically the, the patient uh, the patient surface of course the patient surface uh, that uh, the, you have to maintain the every machine in its optimal conditions for performance in order to give a optimal patient service. Uh, also, that uh, the development and use of uh, advanced technique, for example, uh, if how, how you can get uh, images and analysis with a new software, all right? That's, that, that, that's a long way, uh, this kind of idea going on maybe five years, five years, five years, that's a new software coming up from the, from the vendor or from the, from the market that you that may be used for to help the doctors to diagnose the, the images uh, much better. All right. And then of course, how do we optimize the imaging protocol? All right. That means uh, how do we tune our machine and then what kind of uh, 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 parameters that uh, may may 
may give us a less dose to the patient, but the, the better image quality. That's a, a kind of a how to optimize. And this is, is a long term, long term, uh, very, very long term project because the machine will deteriorate as time goes on, but you want the machine as a as a good at the first day when it was installed. So so everything had to kind of maintain maintain in a better, better uh, kind of a systematic way, all right? Now and then how how and then the quality assurance to each machine, that means you have to to ensure every morning and every morning that the machine is uh, will be perf performed as it should be performed. All right. So so of course all these are kind of a, you 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 manipulate this through some kind of phantoms through some kind of phantoms and uh, your experience as well because sometimes you use your experience to design something the, the machine can be used for patient service for that for that day you know, something like that and uh, and if uh, if you're experienced enough you may kind of uh, advise to the department that uh, maybe some some machine or some equipment or some new software coming up that may that may that may help us to to uh, to diagnostic the, the 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 patient images and so on. All right. Okay. The second part uh, is a uh, local medicine and pest and pest uh, proton emission tomography. I let uh, Doctor City Doctor Doctor City you to talk about this. He is very experienced in that. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Martin. So uh, in this section, we'll go into uh, local medicine and pet. Uh, what I would do in this section is I would very briefly introduce what is nuclear medicine and also what is the role of a physicist in nuclear medicine. Uh, okay, so first of all, what is nuclear medicine and what is it different from a regular X-ray, CT, or radiotherapy department? Now, we both use radiation, that is for sure, but the radiation that we use in nuclear medicine is different from the X-ray. What X-ray or nuclear or radiation therapy, the radiation they use is produced from a machine. As long as the machine, when the machine turns on, there are radiation coming out from the machine, goes to the patient. And if we turn off the machine, the radiation is not there. But for nuclear medicine, it's different. We use radioactive material. As long as I have the radioactive material in my hand, it is radioactive. There's no, it, you can't turn it off and you can say slow it down. It is the characteristic of radioactive material. It will be there and it will be there. And sometimes it is in a solution form. Sometimes it's in a gas form. Sometimes it's in the powder form. So there's a lot higher, a lot higher possibility of contaminations. So the place will be can be contaminated, the staff can be contaminated, or even the machine can be contaminated or even telephones can be contaminated. So in this case, the physicist role in nuclear medicine is, where, is super important. So I will uh, explain this in the next few slides. So in this slides, we actually explain what is the role of a physicist in nuclear medicine. Before that, what do we require of a physicist in nuclear medicine? The first thing is that the physicist would have to have a very in-depth understanding of what type of radiations. How does a radiation interact with matters? How does radioactive material decay? What kind of uh, decay equations? And, more, and also, how do we detect radiations? There are different radiations. For example, the most common, we always heard people say alpha, beta, gamma. Each type of radiation has a different detection mechanisms. How do we detect? How does a uh, nuclear medicine scanner work when the patient go into that tube and how does it come up with an uh, image? So the role of a physicist would have to have an in-depth understanding of that. And in addition to that, would have to supervise how do we reconstruct the image? Because during the scan, what it comes out from the scanner is actually just a whole bunch of electrical signals. And how do a physicist convert it from a whole bunch of electrical signals into a meaningful image so that the doctor can read it? That is actually a very crucial step. And also, uh, a physicist in nuclear medicine is also very important in radiation protection. And in case of emergency, which sounds like impossible, is actually very possible. In case of an emergency, 
a radiation physicist would have to have the whole team to manage the emergency. How do we divert different kind? How do we decide which patients or which personnel or which staff has a higher chance of radiation damage and should be treated immediately? Which one should be isolated? Which one cannot, should not be isolated? And the whole team is headed by a medical physicist. And of course, the medical physicists, like Dr. Martin just mentioned, also have to calculate the exposure to the patients. And the last part in this list is the medical internal radiation dosimetry. That means, remember what I just said is that when the material that we use is a solution and we usually inject it into a patient for diagnosis or treatment of the disease. In this case, the patient itself is radioactive and the whole body is being irradiated by, radi by radiation. So then the, then the medical physicist would have to calculate each specific organs. For example, how much radiation exposure to the liver, how much radiation exposure to kidney, and all these organs can be sensitive to radiation. For example, bone marrow is very sensitive to radiation. So how do we keep the radiation side effect to the minimum? So all these are role of medical physicists in nuclear medicine. So usually it would require a master degree or a PhD degree. So these are just the role of a medical physicist in uh, nuclear medicine. So most of these are just already mentioned in the previous slides. For example, the maintenance, the calibration of scanners, how do we select new equipments? How do we calculate radiation exposure, shieldings? How do we calculate internal radiation of shorter dose, radiation safety? And the last one I would really much like to stress is that the teaching to doctors and radiographers. Now, uh, actually, the whole field of radiology starts from physicists and chemists. So even up to today, for the doctors to obtain their specialty license, they can be a doctor, but in order to be a radiologist, or a nuclear medicine doctor or a, a radiation therapist, they have to go to their specialty exams. And the specialty exams are actually divided into different steps. And the first foremost steps is that they have to pass a subject called radiation, uh, called physics in radiations. And they have to pass it before they can go on. So actually, physicist in the, in the field of radiation medicine is actually very important. For all teaching hospitals, whether it is in Singapore, in Europe, in America, for all the teaching hospitals, they have to teach radiation physics to doctors. Otherwise, they are not qualified to be a teaching hospitals. Now, uh, I just mentioned about that. So I would just touch a very little bit on what is nuclear mass, what is nuclear medicine, and what do we use? So in a very short term, nuclear medicine is to use radioisotopes for the diagnosis and treatments of disease. And the most common radioisotope we use is what we call the technetium 99M. And it is actually tagged in by chemistry reactions to different chemicals. And we inject these chemicals into the patients. And then these chemicals will depend on the physiology of the patient, go to different organs. And from there, we can do our uh, we can, from there, we can do our diagnosis and we can do our therapy. And then this is the decay equation. So uh, because of time constraint, I probably won't go into details of this, but uh, if uh, in the future we have chance, we would certainly like to uh, present more about uh, these physics calculations. So this is what we call a decay scheme, how a radioactive uh, nuclei or radioisotopes, radioactive isotopes decay from one isotope to another and then to another until all the excess energy is given out and become a stable isotopes. And of course, during this is what we call the decay scheme. This is actually what we call the parents, the daughters and the granddaughters. So, and they, of course they come, when they during this decay, they would have half-life, different type of radiations and the half-life and the energy. All these are characteristics of different types of isotopes and it is the nature and you cannot modify it. And this is what we call 
the tagging process, and then these are all the chemicals which come in, in like uh, usual medicine. And we actually put the, this is what we call a generator, which actually generate the radioisotopes, and then we put it into the, and then we put it into the, uh, what we call cold kit, and then it will become the radio, radioactive drugs, which we, we, we can say. But of course, there are a lot of chemistry involved, and there are also a lot of QC, QA involved. This is actually uh, what we call the uh, spec CT scanner, which comes up with, which we have a sodium iodide detector, which detect the radiation coming out from the radio pharmaceuticals inside the patient. And then on the other hand, we also have a CT, gen CT detector, which provides the CT image. And that we combine together and not what we call a spec CT image. Now, this is a typical nuclear medicine scan and it is a bone scan. And as I mentioned earlier, as the radio pharmaceutical get into the patient's body, it depends on the physiology, then we can do the diagnosis. And in this case, it's a typical typical something wrong with the bone here. And you can see a very dark spots, meaning there are much higher metabolism in, of the bone in this part. And in fact, the arrow doesn't point, there are some other parts. For example, these are much darker, these are much darker, and the whole nose is much darker, and this side is much darker, and this side is also much darker. And that means this patient has actually either multiple injury to the bone, or multiple metastasis due to whatever reason. There are another branch of nuclear medicine, what we call PET. And in this branch, the role of a medical physicist is even more important because PET is actually a high energy radioisotope and it is short half-life. So the calculation is even more, has to be even more accurate and more precise. And this is what we this is what you see. What you see here is a PET scanner. And actually, let me backtrack a little bit. What the formation PET positron is actually a, a kind of uh, radiation decay. So when a photon reach nucleus decay, it will go into the neutron and what we call positron. And the positron will actually capture a nearby electron and they actually annihilate each other and they form two gamma ray and ex exactly at 511 keV and exactly opposite to each other. And therefore, if I have a ring shaped scanner and I can catch both gamma ray at the same time, then we can actually back calculate where this annihilation occur. And then if we actually draw multiple lines and then the intersection would be the localization of the isotopes and this is what we call the image reconstruction and physicists play a very vital role in this area. And these are some of the common radioisotopes that we use in, in, in nuclear medicine. And uh, hopefully in the future, we would be able to present even more in this. Uh, this is one of the PET CT scan. And what you see here is a CT scan shows a heart shows the two, uh, this is a female patient, so we will see the right breast and the left breast. Now for the CT scan, actually what you see is that if you can look at here, this is much dense, there is actually some, some of the x-ray doesn't go through, so actually you will see that there is some area here. Now for CT, we can see something wrong here, but we cannot tell exactly what's wrong. In PET, we have, an, we have a radio pharmaceutical that actually mimics glucose metabolism. And most cancer, they have much faster metabolism, so they would take up the glucose much faster. So in this case, they take up the, what we call FDG, the deoxyglucose much faster. And so we are quite confirmed that this is a cancer at the left breast. Okay, so uh, this is a part of uh, nuclear medicine. So at this time, I, I uh, let Dr. Martin continue with the radiation therapy department. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back. Yeah. Uh, another important role for medical physics to, to, to help uh, the, the general public is, the, is working in the radiotherapy department, which is a, a place in the hospital uh, has 
has the equipment of a linear accelerators and other CTs, C, and mostly they have a CT machine nowadays for, for, to simulate uh, patient treatment to ensure the, the treatment can be properly done by the DNAs in the DNA rooms, all right? And of course, as a physicist, uh, lots of uh, phantoms and QA tools are available for the DNAs itself and also for the patient QA. The DNAs is really very complicated, I'll show you later on. And uh, as uh, Dr. Yu mentioned, the radioactive substance and in some uh, kind of a conventional or traditional hospitals, we had used the black therapy surface. That means we use a cesium source uh, to place a cesium source close to the tumor in order to, to let this, the, the radiation from the cesium source to kill the tumor nearby. Uh, but now they seem to be, not, not many people are practicing nowadays, but uh, that, that was still going on. And uh, for doing the linear, linear the radiation treatment for the cancer patient normally it takes about six weeks to two for to two months depends on the on the treatment scheme. Normally it takes about more than a, than a month really. And and uh, and uh, in Singapore, uh, there's a uh, many famous or well known cancer centers in Singapore. In addition to the to to some of free centers of proton proton therapy centers in the coming coming future, so they are. Uh, they basically the standard will be very high indeed. So for for the uh, for the cancer treatments in Singapore. So what is a linear? A linear is is a light like a kind of a wave guy has a the the electrons coming from the electron gun due to the fermionic emission. Okay, travel through a kind of a wave guy, and then there's a, another. And the, they call it steel wave guy, you know, which is basically a column to transfer the RF energy to this long horizontal wave guy column, right? The electron coming up from the electron gun goes through this, uh, this uh, wave guy and pick up the energy, the RF energy supplied, supplied from the, from the RF uh, uh, generators uh, somewhere in the, in the what we call the electronic room and so on, okay? And then the electrons, after getting the energy, they will travel a little bit going through a bending magnet, what we call bending magnet in here. They go through a kind of a 270 degree bending magnet from horizontal traveling to a vertical, uh, to a vertical direction and hits a target, okay? Hits a target like the general X-ray, general gen, uh, general X-ray that I pointed out in earlier uh, earlier, and then to produce to produce a, pro, to produce a, the X-ray X-ray for radi radiotherapy uh, treatment purposes. If you look at this, uh, this is a uh, uh, the image for a linear linear that used for patient surface, and you can see that uh, the detector head. If you Open up this part, you can see the 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 uh, the mallet. And if you open the horizontal part, you can see the see the wave guy over here. So in other words, everything everything over there oh, in the in the in the top slide are basically a com accommodation in the gantry head. All right. If you look closely after the 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 X ray, X -ray coming up from the target, you can see that there's lots of uh, Lots of a beam collimation in order to to strip to strip the the X-ray to some kind of a geometry, uh, so that you don't lose so many X-ray, and then but you 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 still have a lot uh, symmetrical symmetrical beam to go through here, and this, you have a what we call a factoring filter because the X-ray is very forward direction, and you want to to strip it to strip it the the emerging uh, the X-ray coming up. As a very uniform uh, dose of radiation after coming up and then to irradiate the patient up here. Oh, okay, so there's a lot of, uh, if you look at this, that's lots of mechanical and control or electrical control systems here. And they are kind of related to each other. If something broken down, the machine is not working. Or some kind of interlock system being violated, the machine will not working. And they, and uh, if it requires a lot of uh, uh, maintenance and QA to ensure everything's working, because 
once once a, the patient is, is inaccurately or in correctly erated, you cannot do anything at all because it has been the patient is exposed already. So everything has been correct and 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 within the acceptance limit for the performance of the machine. And how how can we how can we kill the this tumor cell with a uh, the radiation that we're talking about, the, 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 there are two kinds of uh, what we call direct damage and indirect damage, all right? Direct damage means that uh, if, a, if there's a radiation coming up to the tumor and directly block out this, the, uh, sorry, block, uh, block to break the double chain of the D DNA, all right? Then the cell will, will die and so on. Now, this direct damage is very efficient or effective by using proton, by using neutrons and other particles, all right? But for those X-ray that I just mentioned, mostly they will do the indirect damage. So a beam of X-ray uh, coming up from the lina, they will evade the patient or the, 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 the tumor, but then within the tumor, there's a lot of blood or, or maybe fluid. And that, mean, that means you can, the X-ray, ionize the, the fluid or water within, within the, the region of the tumor to produce some kind of radicals or what we call, what we call free radicals and, and so on. And this free radicals, they are, they are they have outer cell, outer cell single electrons. And they are very really reactive because they tend to be neutral itself. So it tends to, to, go, to the, go, go to the tumor and then maybe some of, some of them lock out single single break, sing, single single string, and some of them may may lock, may, may break the double string. And if the double string is broken, then the cell will die. Single string, they they may they single cell damage, uh, sing, single string damage, they may, may be, they may repair. As as I, I showed you a little bit later on. And in doing so, in doing so, that uh, the tumor would be would be progressively. Damage have, have as the patient comes up every day, every day for for the treatment. But that's how 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 we can kill the tumor or kill the DNA is that is the following: the repair, what we call the five hour in radiotherapy. The repair, the, the cell can repair after a couple couple of hours after the the exposure to the to the high intensity X ray. Okay, now. And then the patient, uh, sorry, the, the cell can also progress to some kind of a, a cell cycle, which is a rate, which are maybe radio sensitive or radio sen radio resistance, all right. And we want to to irradiate the tumor when the when the tumor cell when the tumor cells are within the radio sensitive phase of this the, the cell cycle. The another R is the repopulation. Repopulation means that the, the, the tumor itself will grow. We grow after maybe a week or two weeks. Normally it takes about a month for them to, to regrow or after, after one or two weeks, after the, 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 the treatment completed, they will regrow what we, what we call relapse, all right? So, so the tumor cell at the end, or some, in some state, they will, they will, they will regrow again. That's what we call repopulation. Of course, we've tried to, in the first hand, you try to kill the kill the cell or kill it within the tumor as much, or we do our best to kill it as soon as uh, as much as possible. The other R is the reoxygenation. Now, if the tumor is close to is close to some kind of a blood vessel, the tumor can get more oxygen from blood, and they are they will become more more radio sensitive. All right. In other words, if the patient if the tumor itself is uh, radio resistance. Like the like the hypoxic, what we call hypoxic cells, that means we will we shall give a little bit more of a radiation or give a little bit more dose in order to compensate the difference between the radio sensitivity with oxygen and the radio resistance with hypoxic cells. All right, this is very important. And then and then, and then obviously uh, different organs have a different radio sensitivity and uh, uh, and. Uh, and also maybe depends on certain or certain kind of a fascination dose scheme that uh, that will help that will give it the most optimal efficiency or the effectiveness for the treatment. All right, this is a five R that uh, that forms the basic for the radiotherapy uh, treatments. And uh, I want to show you.
to show you uh, how, how we do that. This is a CT slice within a prostate and, uh, and the rest, red line is enclosed by the red line is the prostate, all right? And you can see the white line outside. Now, the white, the white line is just a kind of a, a margin if we replace the patient every day, that's a, we cannot place the patient exactly the same as yesterday. So we have a little bit margin, plus maybe one or, one or two mm uh, in difference between, between the, the red line. The, the red line is, is the, where it shows the, the tumor, the tumor uh, volume over here. And then, we, and then we also have a, what we call the organ at risk. That means we don't want to, to expose too much, too much radiation to these organs. For, for example, here, <clears throat> the bladder over here is, is one of the, the, uh, the organ at risk, what we call organ at risk. And the rectum below the prostate over here is also a kind of a, a organ at risk. In other words, we would like to give a, as much of a radiation or, or, or as much of a dose to the tumor, but we don't want to give too much or too many doses to this, uh, what we call organ at risk. How do we do that? Now, today computer can, can it's very clever. I can, I, I can tell the computer that uh, I, want, I, I, I do want so many doses or so many gray of radiation in, in the tumor. And I, and I want this, uh, this uh, to organ at risk not to exceed certain kind of a dose. And then the computer will do the, what we call the, the reverse calculation, all right? To, to do the reverse calculation. To, to say, oh, okay, if you if I want to do, if you want that, I can give you the beam, how do, the beam can come to come from different direction, can give you the results. All right. Uh, this call, this is basically uh, inverse planning. That means that means you give the result, give what, what you want, and then the computer can do the job for you. All right. And now of course we have to to kind of tell whether they are good or bad or maybe modify a little bit to to uh, to optimize. Uh, the treatment planning, all right? This is the, 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 the routine work uh, for the physicist and also for other, uh, basically for other personnel in radiotherapy department to do that. I'll give you an example for the, for the uh, medical physicist in radiotherapy department. Now, for example, we have a, if we have a four DNAs in the department, and then if every, each DNAs, uh, survives or the lifespan is 10, 10 years. In other words, we, every machine will be replaced, replaced 10 years. That means <clears throat> we shall buy the, a new machine in about two, two weeks time, one machine in about two weeks time. And in doing so, you have to ensure that uh, this, the, the bunker or the, 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 the room is sufficient for written shooting. <clears throat> and then there are, there are kind of a, uh, guideline from NDA of Singapore and just follow the guideline, do your calculation and so on. And if you're not sufficient, you have to, to, to discuss with the, build, the, the, building, the building people uh, how, 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 or how thick the concrete you want to add on, something like that. Now this kind of job, this, this kind of assignment, what we call assignment, repeat itself in about two to three, three years time if you have a, a few machines in your center, that means you will, you will be become very, very familiar to doing this kind of a shooting calculation and monitor the progress of the, the bunker if, if the bunker has to be, to be rebuilt. That's kind of thing. So after maybe two or three rounds, you are really familiar with this, this kind of, a, of a, what we call machine replacement and also the bunker, we, we bunker uh, uh, shooting that you would like to add on or, or sufficiently to hold the new machine. All right. This is very important because 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 uh, uh, if if it's not the shooting is not <coughs> it's not sufficient, the NEA will not allow you to to have uh, the patient surface with the new machine. So this is very important for the for the patient QA. We we use uh, some phantoms. That means we irradiate we, we irradiate the the phantom using the the patient planning parameters. And then we can see the images over here or the, the doses in different parts, if they are agree with the patient, patient treatment plan and so on. <clears throat> uh, the example is like this, okay. I have a detector here, 
placed under the lead neck and then using the, the patient uh, parameter to evade the, the, the detector and then the detector can, got the, uh, can get the signal through the computer and then you can do any analysis uh, to, to tell whether the planning or the treatment can be, can be, can be sufficiently or effectively uh, delivered to the patients because if something wrong, something wrong, you can see the images. Uh, very, very weird, very, very, very uncommonly, you can tell something must be wrong or the, the, the plan could be, could be better manipulated. Now, up to now, I, I have not yet, uh, or Dr. Yi and I have not yet discussed that the MRI and the ultrasound. The MRI is particularly important, although it doesn't have any radiation, but then the, the what, what we call the safety, the MRI safety is the most concerned. Uh, I'm not going to, um, we are not going to, to talk about today, uh, maybe in the, common, in the coming future. And also the proton, proton therapy, right? I mean, although we have a few centers here, but uh, obviously time doesn't allow us to, to further I mean, uh, discuss on that. The medical statistic is very important if, uh, you, are, if uh, you are a medical physicist working in a teaching hospital, because there will be lots of uh, project research going on. And at the end of the day, the, the, the doctors will say, ah, I've got some data, can you, can you do some, so this for me, then, 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 uh, then uh, you have to know some of them and, uh, and uh, the, the worst of it, they will, they will lead the result as soon as possible, all right? Okay, now, so far, uh, we, Dr. Dr. G and I have talked about, uh, talk about radiology, leukomat, and radiotherapy. In general, if, you, if a student just graduated, they, they have a BSc. Sometimes they can get into the, the field, get, get into a, as a medical physician in some hospitals or hospitals. And uh, they can work as a junior or what we call trainee, trainee medical physicist. In other words, they work under a, a kind of experienced staff and, uh, and, uh, and in doing so, they can build up the experience and so on, all right? And in some, in some uh, kind of a, a big center or well-equipped center, they can, they can ask you to rotate around <clears throat> with all the look at med and LT in, in order to, in, to accumulate the experience uh, for yourself and so on. Now, from my own, own uh, opinion here, because uh, Singapore still have uh, three proton centers and every center is very huge in uh, kind of uh, the proton center. The proton machine is very huge and sophisticated and, and uh, Look, there, are, there may not be many people have experience uh, in proton therapy. So the demand is very high. I would say very high, all right? Now, if it, <clears throat> now if, uh, if uh, 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 of course, I mean, some, some uh, junior staff can pursue their uh, higher high degree while they are working as a junior. They, they normally do that. And it's, it's very easy, actually. It's, it's very common for them to do that, to pick up a good project that, uh, <clears throat> that they can carry on while they are, they are on, on, on job. And uh, some, some project can, can be uh, very good, for example, using Monte Carlo and AI and so on. <clears throat> I just imagine that a couple uh, in the previous slides are draw the positive. And also this uh, kind of contours can be can be done with AI, okay? So uh, they are doing that. They are doing, lots of people are doing that. And if you are you, you, you are familiar with uh, or, or, or would like to do some Monte Carlo, there's lots of uh, well-known or very famous code, computer code around MCMPX and Cyan4, <coughs> tools and etc. They are they are basically uh, available online, and and then you can using this uh, Monte Carlo code to to simulate some kind of a uh, Linear or some kind of a treatment machine geometry in order, in order to to uh, to count, to interact with your experiments and so on. So lots of people are doing that. Obviously, you can find a find a, a good process around. Okay. So so nowadays uh, there's a lot of uh, university offering the, the higher degree, and if you're going to USA, they will require to to do some, to do some kind of a residence. And for the future, for the future, if, particularly if you're working in USA, you have to pass some kind of a professional examination like APR. That's a, you have, mostly they will require to do that. 
Now this is a, a, a kind of a job advertisement coming around, around July and uh, one of my colleagues gave it to me. You can see that without looking into detail, just looking at this uh, quality control management of stuff and so on, they are exactly the same that uh, uh, Dr. Ju and I just mentioned in this talk. In other words, mostly they will emphasize for, for safety, QA, uh, the emergency handling, waiting protection, teaching, and come some kind of research, okay? So that's, that, 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 that's the normal uh, advertisement that they were looking for people who are little blood to, to their centers, all right? And uh, uh, they ask for, 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 for some kind of a degree, you know, the bachelor degree are still okay. Obviously you can, you, you can uh, proceed the highest, highest study while you're on the job. In here, I just give you some uh, my, uh, a few publications for myself. They are they are easy to read, and you can look at the the spectrum of and each di uh, department, like X-ray, nuclear man, or even the proton therapy now a day, and also some kind of gene imaging that uh, that you may consider whether this uh, medical physics is your hope or your 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 kind of uh, interest for your career. Yeah, I think uh, it would be very good. Good idea to be a medical physicist nowadays, uh, particularly in Singapore. That means uh, you you can serve the the public, and also you can work with uh, some kind of well advanced equipment like proton therapy, full proton machine, and so on. Uh, I think the time is basically running out very well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for help, having a uh, city and I uh, and I here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martin and Sydney, for the very informative session. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, members from the uh, or, like audience, I guess, you know, a few free to, you can either type in the lives uh, in the chat or, you know, you can just raise your hand. I'll, I'll let you uh, ask the question. So, so there's a question. The first question I see is, you know, are internship positions available without the necessary qualifications as a medical physicist? Okay, let me let me answer it. Yeah, you can do the internship, intern what we call residence, without any any uh, experience in uh, medical physics, and that's that's why they in some countries like in USA they would prefer this. They not only they they want you to uh, to be to be in the team as a fresh grad, so that they can teach you from day one, and also that uh, uh, they they want they want some fresh fresh blood or new graduates in the team in order to to be more energetic to do something. Yeah. So I guess where where are these jobs posted? Maybe if I can follow up on that question. Now, in, in, in Singapore, uh, my, my colleague told me that uh, there are some kind of uh, website that, uh, that uh, you, can, you, you can find the jobs and, and tell them uh, what kind of jobs you would like. And for example, medical fees, they will, after that, after that they, will, they will keep sending similar jobs requirements or similar job advertisement to your, to your email boxes and so on. And for, for those in, this, in, in overseas, like in the States or Australia, or something like that, uh, most, most of them, they, they, they uh, advertise their requirement or job requirement or the, their job post through some kind of uh, uh, journals, okay? Or some journals. And also some full kind of uh, what we call the, 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 the agent that, uh, that uh, they help, help the people to, to get the right persons. Yeah. Okay, if I may uh, just uh, add on a little bit. Uh, there are several ways. Uh, I think sometimes you can also go to their websites. Yeah. Uh, there are actually professional websites for uh, medical physicists. And uh, in many cases, the uh, center would uh, post those uh, vacancies. And also, of course, the medical journals, especially there are quite a number of medical physics journals and they would post that. And also you can write direct to their medical yeah. physics department head. 
And in fact, this is the most effective way, just write direct to them. Sometimes in, in many cases, in, in, in fact, from my own experience is that in many, many cases, they never intend to have that. But once somebody write in, they actually find the person very interested in this field, they would try their best to open up a position for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually uh, what Doctor Sidi uh, just mentioned about directly writing to the department head or to the department. It's very efficient indeed because uh, uh, so, some some department they kind of a 50 50 situation to whether to, to hire someone and certainly someone uh, with uh, their their under their radar or within their their requirement they will probably uh, can open a post or, or accommodate a little post for you to uh, I mean I, would, I mean people have have to be retired and so on and then they will they will uh, or they they would like to have a new this kind of a new new graduates uh has has a, has a, another extra extra manpower for the own future for their, for their own future yeah so maybe i'll ask the questions okay so anyway sure. if there are more questions feel free to type in the chat so i guess just now you, you on one of the slide you said that your um a lot of the centers locally they are looking for graduates with msc or even like phds but my understanding is, you know, like in Singapore, there's only like bachelor degrees or minors offered by NUS and SIT, right? So, so where, where can they actually study to get like those qualifications that you, you mentioned in your presentation? Yeah, I, uh, now, now there are, there are some, some graduates. Once they graduate, they, they got their BSc or bachelor degree, they, they, go to, uh, they go to overseas like UK, or Australia, or even USA, to pursue their master or PhD in, in medical physics, or med sometimes they call it biomedical. Okay, something something like that. And and uh, it's very common after you graduate from them or full time st study graduation, they will hire you as a as you just mentioned about the, the internship or residence. This is very popular or common in USA. Once you finish a PhD, you can stay in, in the department for maybe two or, two or three years more under some training and get your get your residence or get your APR certificate. That's what I just mentioned. That's very common nowadays in USA. Now in New Australia, they do have they, they do offer similar situations. All right. Uh, I cannot remember the name of the certificate, but but uh, but uh, lots of people uh, they graduate with their BC, uh, with their BSc, they directly go into the department study for a master or a PhD and, and after that they spend maybe two or three years with the in the department to get you know to, to get the professional certificates. After that they can they, they can work on their own. That means the mark they can have a have a they, they are very attractive to other hospitals because once you got these certificates or experience the hospital or the hospital themselves they don't have to train on the little on on, 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 on this person they will maybe Directly go into go into into their post and and serve the, the department or serve the, the the public. Okay, uh, if I may add on to yeah. what Dr. Yes. Martin has just mentioned, uh, after graduate, there are actually a couple of ways to get in uh get into this field uh with a higher qualifications. Unfortunately, in Asia, I don't see much uh, uh structural training, but in US and Australia, there's quite a bit. Uh, there is actually a lot of US universities offer two year uh, coursework master degree in uh, medical physics. And some university even offer a four year uh, doctoral degree. They call it doctor of medical physics instead of a PhD. And those are professional doctors. And uh, so depending on our, uh, how, what kind of degree you want. And uh, nowadays, because of the COVID situation, there's a lot of this kind of degree. They actually becoming half online, half on site. That means a lot of coursework can be done online. And then the last year or the last uh, nine months will be on site. 
after you finish, after the person finish the uh, required coursework, they are required to go for one year to two year residency. That means they would go to work as a uh, apprentice in the hospitals, follower, uh, shadowing an experienced medical physics to, to uh, obtain their experience. So um, these are probably the general way to go into uh, this field. So I guess um, since today is like the insider perspective, right? So I guess um, maybe you can share some tips, I guess, you know, uh, Martin or Sydney, like you, mm -hmm. you guys are very experienced, like, like you know, what, what is like, uh, what do you find fulfilling about this job? You know, maybe you can share some personal anecdotes and, and things like this. Martin, start first. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. The, 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 the thing I would like to emphasize here is that uh, this is a field, it's a, <clears throat> it's a kind of a occupation, so like a job, huh? that you can make use of your, your experience, or you can make use the thing that you, you learn from, uh, from uh, university or from your higher degree studies, and then you can directly serve the general public. Uh, even, though, even though you may not face the, face the patient every day, but you collaborate with other professional uh, medical professionals in order to do something for the for the patients. I, I think it's the most the most important for for me as a personal uh, is that uh, I can practice or I can earn my money by doing something that I have I, I have uh, experience and knowledge in it because I have I'm go through I'm going through a kind of a, a, a physics or mathematics or simulations and so on and and uh, in doing so. Uh, the patient or, or the facility is getting better, or some kind of a, some other professionals, better professional, they know you that you can do this. And once they they did this kind of a, uh, expertise, they will come to me or come to another city that uh, in order to, to form a team, and this team will will serve the, the general public. That's the, I would say that's the most important. Yeah. Okay. Um. From the nuclear medicine, from the uh, nuclear medicine side, uh, medical physics is actually a very crucial, as a cru very crucial member of the team. Now nowadays, medical work is no longer just a one man show. And like the old days, then they have the doctor designing everything. So nowadays, the, the the medical field is becoming more and more high tech. And then each member is becoming a team, and each member of team has its special knowledge and uh, physics is actually one of it. So uh, as nowadays, we are actually nowadays, our treatments and diagnosis have become more and more sophisticated. So the physics role would become higher and higher. Now, uh, I haven't got in, really got into the uh, decontamination, safety and emergency. And that uh, we actually in, like today, we actually only focus on uh, serving the patients. We actually haven't got, we haven't, we actually haven't talked about before starting the department. How do we plan the, how do we plan the department? I mean, physically, how do we build? How thick is the wall? How large the room should be? How, uh, how thick the shielding should be? These are all medical physicists. And I also haven't got into the industry side. Actually, there is actually a huge area that the use of radiation in industry. For example, how do we do non-destructive testing of uh, the, the steel, the metal, whether it is going into metal fatigue or not. And all these are radiations and all these are physicists plays a very important role in that. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I thought you had to finish. Please go on. <laughs> oh, no, I finished that. I finished that already. I think there are two questions from in the slide, in the chat. One is, you know, will, will you, is it possible for you to share the slides with the students? And the second is, you know, can you recommend a particular, particular universities in Asia that specialize in a graduate medical physics program? Yeah, I think I think you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, our slides can be shared. Obviously, that's the purpose of uh, of our uh, of our of our or our, our purpose to share the our experience. Now, in Asia, seems to me that there's not uh, a kind of a very structural or well-defined program 
leading the, the graduate from master to, to PhD in metal physics, MD. And in doing so, in, in this kind of a graduate study, they will teach you 100% within the, the field. Uh, I cannot see any university offering this systematic or structurally, okay? Uh, if you ask me which country is the best for doing so, I would say the USA would be, would be, would be better because they have been doing this for, for the last 20, 30 years. And in, over there in the USA, they, they are, I would say, more than 10 famous centers that serve this kind of purposes. All right. Now, of course, I mean, you can, you can also do the same thing in Asia, but uh, uh, it depends how you plan this kind of a program, whether you, you have uh, the right professor to do that and right equipment to do that, or how can you collaborate with a local hospital so that these uh, graduates can get the hands-on or can, can practice their, their skills and also they can carry on their research projects. That's, that's the main, 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 I would say the main struggles or main problems uh, so far in some, in some Asian countries. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Martin. So far, I have not seen uh, any um, university in Asia that provides a very structural teaching and practice in this area. Uh, I think uh, of around the world, I think the US has the best. They have a much more, maybe because they have much more experience in this, just simply because they have more experience in this. Uh, okay, so I think in the interest of time, uh, let's thank uh, Sydney and Martin again for a very uh, informative sharing session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Aoya. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.